On this episode, Congressman Bruce Westerman. Uh, if you look at what's happening under Joe Biden's leadership, under Democrats in Congress's leadership, it's it's a total failure. Their energy policy is terrible. They're they're causing more greenhouse gas emissions with their energy policy uh, than than we've had before. I'm David M. Drucker with the Washington Examiner, and welcome to another edition of In Trump's Shadow: The Battle for 2024, a Ricochet podcast and a companion to my book, published by 12 Books, In Trump's Shadow, The Battle for 2024 and the Future of the GOP. I caught up with Westerman a while ago while he was attending a conference in Washington sponsored by the American Conservation Coalition, a conservative group that believes climate change is real and man-made and a problem, but that believes the Democratic Party's approach to addressing the issue is all wrong and counterproductive. Westerman, an Arkansas Republican, is something of a forestry and environmental wonk. And we spent a few minutes chatting climate change, what conservative policy should be on the issue, and whether it's helpful when a certain well-known Republican, you might have heard of him, refers to climate change as a hoax. And now, Bruce Westerman. Congressman Bruce Westerman from Arkansas's very rural 4th Congressional District, Thanks for joining us on In Trump's Shadow. Yeah, great to be with you. So um, obviously here at the American Conservation Coalition's conference, there's a lot of talk about conservative solutions to the issue of climate change. Um, I wanted to sort of get your sense on how you know Republicans approach this issue, how you think they should approach the issue, and and particularly for Republican voters who who care about the environment, may believe that certain things need to be done, but so much of what proliferates um, in Washington and in the news media about what these solutions are supposed to be, they don't fit, you know, conservatives tend to not necessarily agree with all of that. So how do you approach all of this? Uh, It's it's a great question. And I've looked at this pretty extensively. Number one, we have to embrace our heritage. Conservatives are the original conservationists. You know, Teddy Roosevelt started the conservation movement. Teddy Roosevelt was a Republican. Uh, if you look at uh, what the left likes to refer to as the uh, bedrock environmental laws of our country, most of those were done under Richard Nixon. Uh, you have the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, the formation of the EPA. All of these were done um, with good intent and purpose for the right reasons, and the the left's bastardized it. They've taken these laws and weaponized them, and they're actually preventing conservation efforts from, from taking place. We see it all the time in uh, uh, the abuse of NEPA. We see government programs like the environmental, or the NEPA Ecological, is? The National Environmental Policy Act. Okay. And it's the permitting process you've got to go through uh, to, uh, to build something. They they delay projects. They uh, delay forest management. Uh, you know, when people are trying to do the right things to help the environment, uh, somebody with under the guise of helping the environment will sue the federal government, and a court order will stop a good thing from happening. Yeah, I remember when I was a cub reporter in California, there was always this uh, fight over clearing out the undergrowth in California forests to present, to, to take away all the fuel for forest fires. Um, and the environmental lobby would push back on that, believing that you were you know, messing with, with habitat. Um, I, the issue of climate change itself, I feel like it, it can be a loaded term, uh, depending on what audience you're speaking to. But l- let's just talk about the issue of whether uh, human beings living the way we live, which I think is kind of cool. Um, but if if human beings are having an impact on the climate, and if that impact is negative, um, do you believe those things to be the case or do you look at it differently? Well, activity causes uh, an effect. So you can't say humans aren't having an effect on the climate. Climate, you can substitute the word carbon for it. The best we can measure carbon 
Before the Industrial Revolution, it was 280 parts per million in the atmosphere. Today, it's over 420 parts per million. So there's no denying that human activities have put more carbon in the atmosphere. But it's not something that we should be such alarmist about. We should be looking for proactive solutions on how to get that carbon out of the atmosphere and how to, how to maintain the level of lifestyles that we have uh, without further putting more carbon into the atmosphere and without wrecking our economy. So I totally agree with that uh, for selfish reasons. Um, but what I what I'm just want to understand as a baseline is if we were to do nothing, I mean, nobody wants to do nothing in that. If you look at the United States over time, we we have cleaner air, cleaner water. We've reduced our carbon emissions. We, we're especially in the developed world. I mean, I don't know if anybody surpasses what we're no, able We're to number do. one in the world in reducing but carbon But if we did yeah. nothing else than we're doing now, would would the in, would our impact on the climate become a negative for us that would lead to bad things? So what's happening right now the United States produces less than 15% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. You're seeing China at over 30% and growing. Uh, while we were replacing coal plants with natural gas plants that greatly reduce greenhouse gas emissions, China built 38 gigawatts of coal power plants last year. That's one huge coal power plant every week. Uh, we can't look at this in a vacuum. We can't solve the problem in the United States. Uh, developing countries, uh, they may give it lip service, but they could care less about carbon in the atmosphere. They want energy and they want progress. By the way, can we solve the problem at all if they don't get with the get with a program that that deals with it, that no, but, adopts more policies similar to what we have in the United States? No, and like, we, would it matter what the U.S. does? I mean, if we were if the U.S. Just magically, I love to do this because it's my podcast and I yeah. can make things up. But if we were able to just magically have zero carbon emissions. And China kept belching out, you know, uh, emissions from its coal-fired power plants that they're creating day after day in India and other parts of the developing world uh, or even developed world. Would, would it make a difference? A, a very small difference. Uh, you know, there's this huge focus in the United States that would make you think that if we went to all electric vehicles in the United States, it would solve all the world's problems with, uh, with climate. I think that's being driven more by Wall Street looking at new areas to invest um, than it has to do anything with climate. If 15%, less than 15% of the global climate emissions are from the U.S. 27% of that comes from automobiles, from all of transportation, not just automobiles, planes, trains, cars, construction equipment, farm equipment. If somehow you could magically put an electric battery in all of those things, which you can't, you would reduce the world's greenhouse gas emissions um, by less than 4% if every electron going into those batteries was produced carbon free. The reality is replacing every combustion engine in the United States with a battery gets you less than 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So do we still have too many coal fired power plants or just power plants that are put, putting emissions into the air that don't make up for the emissions not coming out of the car because that's i i was asking somebody else about this but you know i'm old enough to remember that even if we had had electric cars 40 50 years ago right in, instead of the exhaust coming out of the car it just would have there would have been more electricity yeah, it comes out of the, the coal power right plant but have we improved power that enough that it, it's a net improvement is it a net improve if 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 yeah, we shift we, to electric cars let's just say people decide they like them or whatever would it have a net improvement that was worth all the trouble Globally, again, uh, transportation emissions are 23%. When you look at industry and buildings, you're up 40 to 50% of global emissions. So all the focus seems to be on automobiles where it's the... Well, because that's what people can see, right? <laughs> right. And, and that's where there's opportunity to create a new trinket and generate trillions so of So what do you economics. do about the buildings issue? So that's an interesting issue. So what do you do about that? So if you look at a, a bill I've filed called the Trillion Trees Act about planting a lot of trees, we've also got a component in there about uh, a tax credit for sustainable buildings. And you reduce the amount of energy that you use to build a building. 
the amount of energy you use to operate a building. And you can also, with wood, you can store more carbon in the building. Um, so it's innovative things like that. It's creating the technology, especially on the energy side, that the rest of the world is going to adopt. The rest of the world cares about, number one, getting energy and getting it affordable. Then they want it reliable and they really don't care if it's clean. So we need to figure out how to make affordable, reliable energy that's clean so that, the, that India and China and other developing parts of the world will adopt that technology because it's affordable and reliable. So you have a lot of ideas and, as you just mentioned, legislation that would uh, reduce human impact on the climate, on our environment. Um, is this, from your perspective, worth doing just because it's worth doing? Or do you believe that we have to find a way to reduce our impact on the climate to preserve it and and not end up 100 years from now, 200 years from now, 50 years from now um, with impacts that people will then have to deal with and it won't be as easy as, as it is now? I, I believe in stewardship. And stewardship's really another word for conservation. And we should always be good stewards and practice conservation. I, I tell the story, I was fortunate to go to, to Yale to study forestry, but I learned more about conservation uh, from my granny, who was a child of the Depression, than I did at the Yale School of Forestry. When I was a kid and she planted a garden, she made sure that we utilized every single thing that came out of that garden. Nothing went to waste. A conservative is someone who believes in unchosen obligations. And we've got an unchosen obligation to use as much as we need, but not more than we need, and to take care of what we have to leave the world in a better place. We're obligated to the future to leave it in a better place than we found it. Um, the, the U.S., the globe actually, but the U.S. in particular um, is experiencing right now a period of, of historically high inflation, uh, record high gas prices. Um, do these conditions make it, do these economic conditions and the, and the political fallout from them make it harder for these issues that you've been focused on to be addressed? Uh, does it make it easier um, with maybe people more open to uh, innovation because the standard way we have been doing things uh, has been very easy, but now is a lot more expensive. So maybe if you have a new idea for a, a more sustainable building um, or trinket, that people would say, huh, you know, I wouldn't have thought about doing it that way because why not? Because what for? But if you can save me money, now I'm, I'm interested. Well, what, so how, how does the current so uh, you, thing we're going through, the period we're going through impact all of this? Well, there's this idea that you can't have uh, a strong economy and a healthy environment at the same time. And I would argue that you look at the cleanest, safest, healthiest environments in the world, and it's where you have the strongest economies. And if we move into a position where inflation is increasing, which means uh, people's money has less purchasing power, uh, where they're focused more on the basic needs, uh, there's going to be less um, money to invest in, uh, in new technologies and new practices. So what we have to do is figure out how to make the economy and the environment work together. And it gets into what I would call market-based conservation. Um, that's how we can solve the problem. Uh, if you look at, um, you know, people have to eat, people have to keep warm. And if it gets down to, um, you know, killing an animal that you have to have for food or conserving that population of animals, people are going to kill the animal. If it gets down to clearing trees so you can plant food to eat um, or starving, you're going to cut down the tree and plant the, the crop. If you have to have wood to, to burn to keep warm, you're going to burn the wood to keep warm. Uh, Democrats like to say that Republicans are climate deniers. Um, I have an issue with that term because I just think it's politically charged and it, it sounds a lot like Holocaust denier. And, it, it, yeah. and I don't like the similarity between those because of what it suggests. But but look, you're with Republicans all day long on Capitol Hill. <laughs> there are over 200 of you, 
probably after November, a whole bunch more than that. Um, but um, do Republicans generally believe that humans have an impact on, and I mean, elected Republicans that you serve with, you can't speak for everyone all over the country, but do elected Republicans you serve with in the House of Representatives be- tend to, do they generally believe that human beings are having, having an impact on the climate and that there are things that should be done about that conservative things different things than what the left wants but is that the general consensus or is it an ongoing and unsettled debate with within the, the, the conference so i i think everybody is it's intellectually honest and the colleagues i serve with republicans know that human activity has an impact where you get called the climate denier is where you start questioning what is that impact if you want to understand how much is the impact and how much should we invest and work on solutions to mitigate that impact, that's where you get the differences. And the left is that, you know, I think they wake up every morning scared to death and alarmed that if we don't set our hair on fire today about the climate, then you're a climate denier. So I, I like to say the, the left has a climate agenda. Republicans and conservatives have a climate plan. We have an energy plan. Uh, If you look at what's happening under Joe Biden's leadership, under Democrats and Congress's leadership, it's it's a total failure. Their energy policy is terrible. They're they're causing more greenhouse gas emissions with their energy policy uh, than than we've had before. Uh, The demand for energy hasn't gone away. And guess what? It's not going to go away. So if we're not producing it here in the U.S. in the cleanest, safest, most efficient way possible, you see Joe Biden going to Saudi Arabia, you see him asking Venezuela and Iran for more oil, you're putting it on a boat and shipping it across the ocean, emitting a lot of carbon versus taking it out of Canada and putting it in a pipeline that was going to use all renewable energy to transport that that oil to the refineries on the in the Gulf. So. Um, Natural gas has allowed the U.S. to reduce greenhouse gas emissions more than uh, any other country in the world, and more than anybody in the Paris Climate Accords combined, uh, yet they're demonizing natural gas. Uh, maybe someday we can get rid of natural gas, but it's not tomorrow. <laughs> Definitely not tomorrow. Yeah. One last question before I let you go. It is in Trump's shadow, so everybody here, it's a rule that I made up. Uh, but I get to enforce it gets one question related to Trump. Uh, but I, I'm going to expand it here. So it's not so annoying. Uh, President Trump uh, likes to say that, you know, the idea of climate change is a big hoax perpetrated by the left. But other Republicans like to say that, hey, this is just no problem at all. And it's just the left. They want to tax. They want to spend. They want to take away your steaks. And which I get very sensitive because I like my steaks. Yeah. Um, uh, but when when somebody like President Trump calls climate change a hoax and when other Republicans say there's nothing to see here at all, this is, you know, a whole made up issue. Um, obviously, you know, if we talked about the left, we could go all day about how they discuss things that are un, that are made untrue and unhelpful. Uh, but do, do you like it when you hear that from your own party? Is that helpful or or or? Or is it inconsequential to the discussion? Yeah, in the overall messaging, it can be be hurtful. I'll, I'll give you an example. I'm the only forester in Congress. When President Trump said something about raking the forest, I had reporters calling me left and right. What do you think about that, Congressman? Well, raking the forest isn't really a term I learned in forestry school, but the idea of cleaning the underbrush out is a term. I think when the president says it's a hoax, um, He's talking about the agenda that the left has where they're trying to manipulate people uh, through their alarmism on on climate. That is a hoax. That's people trying to raise money, uh, trying to push a political agenda and using the climate instead of actually looking at what the real problems are and trying to solve those problems. So there is a, a climate hoax out there, but it's the agenda that's being pushed by the left. Uh, that doesn't mean you're a climate denier when I hear people talk about the left having a hoax. Um, but what we have to do is focus on what the problem is and how we solve that problem. All right. So kind of like it, it depends on what the meaning of is. is. <laughs> yeah. 
You're Arkansas. From so Arkansas. I, I had to get yeah. I had to get that in there. Congressman Bruce Westerman of Arkansas's fourth congressional district and a, a forester. Yeah. The Engineering first, undergrad and a forestry grad. Awesome. Probably the two worst degrees to have to serve in Congress. I don't know. I mean it's made you just smarter than a lot of your colleagues on Capitol Hill. Thanks so much for joining us on In Trump Shadow. Thank you, Dave. Brian Johnson is the producer of this episode of In Trump's Shadow, The Battle for 2024. My book, In Trump's Shadow, The Battle for 2024 and the Future of the GOP, is now available for purchase wherever books are sold. And every day, you can find my work online at www.WashingtonExaminer.com. We'll see you next time. Ricochet. Join the conversation.